1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 13. Before we get started, though, I wanted to read to you from our reading in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 18, verse 20. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. I wanted to read this to you because I ask for your prayers each and every week that when I get up here that I would not become an ash pile, that I would actually speak uh, the words of God uh, that he has given to us and be faithful to that and not deviate in, in any way. So uh, just ask for your prayers. Father God, we come before you, come into your presence and are thankful for your word I ask that you would lead me and guide guide me, that um, my words would re reflect what you have revealed to us in your word, and Lord God, that we would take this to heart, uh, and that there would be transformation in our lives, you would change us to make us more into the image of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's in his mighty name that we pray, amen. So I was... I, I was Thinking about this, and uh, uh, a lot of you who are fathers might be able to relate to this, fathers that have a son, and maybe you kind of, uh, at one point in your, in your life, you're, you're working on something, you're trying to fix something up, and your little boy comes up to you and says, Daddy, can I help you with that? And you're thinking to yourself, great. Now it's going to take twice as long to get this fixed. Now it's going to, it's going to be a whole bunch of hassle to try and get this fixed. And, and yet, you, you, you know, you think, okay, I should probably do this, pass on some knowledge to my son about how to fix these things, how to work on these things. And so, you, you know, okay, right, you can help me out. And then maybe you get a little frustrated during that time, and maybe your son walked away dejected. Or maybe uh, mom is preparing a meal in the kitchen and the daughter comes up to her, the little daughter, and says, can I help you with the meal? And you're like, man, it's been a long day. I just want to get the food. I don't know if you're, you're, uh, you're like us in our, ha uh, in our household. Uh, we call it when you're, when you're not eating, uh, uh, when we don't have food, at least for me. We call it spangry. Instead of, you know, you, people get angry when they're getting hungry. We're, we're spangry when we, get hu we hung when we get hungry. So you're thinking, oh, now, okay, she wants to help out with this. It's going to be extra mess. And maybe you just kind of pawn her off and say, why don't you maybe play a game on the iPad or something like that? You know, we just kind of, we can push things aside pretty quickly. And, and you know, we would say that we want to, to help out, help our children to learn and, and to know and to grow. And the scripture says that though that knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Uh, many of us have trouble passing off our knowledge to our children in a, in a way that is loving and caring because, quite frankly, we lack the patience sometimes uh, to help them along the way, to grasp maybe how to fix a bicycle or to, to grasp uh, how to make a nutritious meal. Many of us would say as parents, we would forgo our wants. In other words, maybe to, 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 to get the project done quickly or to get the meal out in, in a, in a uh, efficient way as possible, we would say we would want to forgo our wants so that our children would grow and, and, would, and would gain knowledge in, in, in a caring and compassionate and loving environment. We would say it, but if we're honest with ourselves, somehow it's difficult in practice to forgo what we want what we want for who we love, who we say we love, and we say we love them deeply and dearly. 
Now, while this is difficult enough in our own families to use our knowledge in a way that shows that we care and we, we love them and we want to pass this on to them, to our, to our children, uh, to our spouse, and maybe even the interaction between child and parents, we want to do this. It becomes that much more difficult when we have interactions with people around us, especially when the way that we use our knowledge about God may at times actually become a stumbling block for somebody in their walk, in their relationship with God. We use this knowledge in a way that doesn't build up, but tears down. Now, Paul addresses this very issue in our reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 8, in his letter to the, the church in Corinth, uh, which is in modern-day Greece. And um, I want you to take a moment. He, he uses a contemporary example for them. And I want you to take a moment with me to put yourself back almost 2,000 years ago into, that ta- into the, to the city of Corinth and what Paul is speaking. So here you are as a Christian in Corinth. And you're you're there walking through the city. And what would you notice if you're in the city of Corinth back then? Would you see any church buildings whatsoever? No. There's not a single church in the entire city. They met in house churches. You wouldn't be able to notice it. What you would notice is the great temple to Apollo. And what you would notice is several other things set up, uh, icons and other things set up to various other gods that they were giving honor to. Now, you're you're a Christian now, and you know that all of these idols are meaningless. They're false. You also know that you know, the, 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 the town, the, where they have get-togethers at times at the temple, at various temples. And so they have the barbecue there at the temples. And you think to yourself, you know what, as a Christian, well, maybe I can go there and uh, have a, a chance to talk to some of my neighbors and others about Jesus. And so you decide, since you know that There is no such thing as these false gods. There's no such thing as Apollo. There's no such thing as these other other gods that are there. You know that you can go there and eat because God is the creator of everything. And if you give thanks for the food you're going to receive, give thanks for it. And you don't have to worry about these these false gods and these, these, these false idols because They're completely meaningless. So you decide to go and be a part of of that. And um, you take part in this. And let's say, furthermore, because you're now you've kind of dug into the scriptures yourself and you know some other things uh, that you've read in the Scripture, and you remember a passage from Isaiah chapter 44 that really uh, drives home how silly idol worship is. And so you remember this passage where it talks about someone making an idol. He cuts down cedars, and he chooses a cypress tree or an oak and lets it grow strong among the trees of the forest. He plants a cedar, and the rain nourishes it. Then it becomes fuel for a man. He takes part of it and he warms himself. He kindles a fire and he bakes bread over it. Also, out of the same cedar or oak tree, he makes a god and he worships it. He makes it an idol and falls down before it. Half of it he burns in the fire. Over the half he eats meat. He roasts it and is satisfied. Also, he warms himself by the fire. Aha, I am warm. I have seen the fire, he says. And the rest of the wood he makes into a god, his idol. And then what he makes with his own hand, he worships it. And he prays and he says this, Deliver me 
you are my salvation. You are my God. So you know these passages and how silly that really is. You know an idol, an idol is nothing at all. And you don't see any problems with eating because you know that this stuff is all foolish. Apostle Paul says that in verses 4 through 6 from 1 Corinthians chapter 8 where he says this, Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that what? An idol has no real existence and that there is no God but one. For though there are... There may be so-called gods in heaven and or, or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and there are many lords. Yet for us, there is one God, the Father from whom all things are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. So you know all of that. But what are you missing? What are you missing? You have all this knowledge about this, that there's only one true God, and your very existence is because of him. And because of that, you can, he's the creator of everything. You can give thanks for your food and receive it. It doesn't matter what other people think, but that's the problem. You're not thinking about other people. When we go down a certain path, we might not think about them at all. We're only thinking about ourselves. We have knowledge. But what are we using that knowledge for and in what way are we using that? We may be using that knowledge in a way that leads other people away from God. Even though we have the right, the Apostle Paul acknowledges that, don't use the right that you have to be a stumbling block to someone else. We have the right but we're not acting in love then when we exercise that right in a certain way. Now, what does that have to do with us? What does that have to do with us here in modern-day America? We could easily write off a passage like that because as far as I know, walking around State College, I haven't seen too many temples set up. Well, unless you want to count Beaver Stadium and, and maybe, uh, you know, the tailgating that goes on before a football game. Other than that, I really haven't seen any temples set up where people are offering food sacrifice to idols. So what does that have to do with us? Well, not so fast for us. An idol is anything that people look to for comfort. What do you look to for comfort? What do you look to for protection in your life? What do you look for, to for, for hope in a future in your life? One of the great freedoms that we have in this nation is the freedom to freely vote for the candidate of our choice. It's a great blessing. We have this freedom to vote for the candidate of choice. As Christians, we're biblically encouraged to participate in the political process. But is it possible that at times, the perception may be that we project to other people, that at times, that perception is that our real hope is not in Jesus Christ, but in the right candidates and the right political party? being elected to office. I, I, I was just talking to someone the other day and asked, uh, you know, they were kind of new to the country, what did, what do you, what did, what's your observation? One of the things they observed is how utterly divided our nation is. That's an outsider telling us, what, this is what they see, how utterly divided our nation is. I'm not advocating for Christians, hear me right, I'm not advocating for Christians withdrawing from the political process. We're to be involved. But is the way in which I participate in that potentially a stumbling block to someone else's walk with Christ? Is the way in which I participate? 
Never have I heard such apocalyptic terms associated with, a, with an election as the outcome of our, our last election. Whether this person won, and it's going to be the end of civilization, or this person lost, it's going to be the end of civilization, or the other person won, that's going to be the end of our civilization. And when we do that and we join in on that as, as Christians, we're actually showing others that our trust and hope is not in God, but in a political candidate or a political party. Now, at the end of the day, it does matter, my political knowledge, your political knowledge. Am I using it to build myself up or to tear others down? Or am I engaging others in love for the sake of Jesus Christ who bled and who died for them, for all people? Apostle Paul goes on to say this in verses 11 through 13. He says, And so by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed, the brother for whom Christ died. Thus sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble, lest I make him fall. Let me say again, I'm not advocating for Christians to withdraw from the political process. That, that's disastrous. What I am saying is that when we address the political issues and the candidates of our nation uh, with others, do they unmistakably walk away from that conversation that we've had with them to knowing that our true hope is found in Jesus Christ and in Him alone. That our true hope is found in Him. That salvation never has arrived on Air Force One. It hasn't. Salvation came in the personal work of Jesus Christ who bled and died for each and every one of us on the cross, who suffered in our place. And God is able to do infinitely more than we can imagine. Infinitely more than we can imagine. With the people that you interact with and that I interact with, uh, would they say this about you and I? after they've had a conversation with us. Paraphrasing from the psalmist, some trust in chariots and some trust in horses, but that man, that woman, huh, unmistakably trusts in the name of the Lord God. Do they come away with that when we've had a conversation? Back in 1946, there was a small diner that opened in Atlanta, Georgia. It was called the, the Dwarf Grill. Through the years, that, that uh, grill was, was very successful and until finally in 1967, uh, founder Truett Cathy opened the first Chick-fil-A. Now, obviously, if you're going into the restaurant business, besides make, you want to make some good food so customers come back, but what is another thing? You want to make a profit, right? Otherwise, you're not going to be in business for very long. It's kind of a, a duh. Yes, if I'm going into business, I need to make a profit. Otherwise, it's not going to last for very long, this, this thing. So you would think that Truett Cathy, being a businessman, and knowing that many people go out to, to uh, lunch or to, to dinner after, after church on a Sunday, that he would have... Chick-fil-A is open on a Sunday. But he was willing to forgo what he wanted, profit, for who he loved, the Lord. He was willing to forgo that. And today, Chick-fil-A has the highest same-store sales and the largest quick-service chicken restaurant chain in the United States of America, based on annual System-wide sales. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. What am I saying to you this morning? I'm not saying that if you do what Truett Cathy did, 
you're going to be so blessed as a restaurant mogul. I'm not saying that to you today. What I am saying is love God, love people. Love God and love people. I'm saying that if you do that, you will bless someone else in their walk with God. And that is a matter of eternal worth and significance. Are we willing to forego what we want for who we love? Let's pray. Father God, help us in our weakness. Help us, Lord God, to forgo our wants, our desires, for who we say we love. We confess that we love you. We confess that we love people around us, but Lord God, give us the strength that our actions would reflect that confession of our mouth. Help us, Lord God. We're so thankful for your son, who in that garden on the night of his very betrayal, as he prayed, he said, Lord, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will be done but your will be done. He was willing to forgo what he wanted for who he loved. Make it so in our lives, Lord God, by the power of your spirit and by the power of your grace and mercy. We pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.